Video 2 of Common Sense by Thomas Paine Some convenient tree will afford them a state house under the branches of which the whole colony may assemble to deliberate on public matters. It is more than probable <clears throat> that their first laws will have the title only of regulations and be enforced by no other penalty than public disesteem. In this first <clears throat> parliament, every man by natural right will have a seat. But as the colony increases, the public concerns will like increase likewise, and the distance at which the members may be separated will render it too inconvenient for all of them to meet on every occasion, as at first, when their number was small, their habitations near, and the public concerns few and trifling. This will point out the convenience of their consenting to leave the legislative part <clears throat> to be managed by a select number chosen from the whole body, who are supposed to have the same concerns at stake which those who have a, who appointed them, and who will act in the same manner as the whole body would act were they present. If the colony continues increasing, it will become necessary to augment the number of the representatives, and that the interest of every part of the colony may be attended to. It will be found best to divide the whole into convenient parts, each part sending its proper number, and that the elected may never form to themselves an interest separate from the electors, Prudence will point out the propriety of having elections often, because as the elected might by that means return and mix again with the general body of the electors in a few months, their fidelity to the public will be secured by the prudent reflection of not making a rod for themselves, and as this frequent interchange will establish a common interest with every part of the community, they will mutually and naturally support each other. And on this, not on the unmeaning name of king, depends the strength of government and the happiness of the governed. Here then is the origin and rise of government, namely a mode rendered necessary by the inability of moral virtue to govern the world. Here too is the design and end of government. VIZ dot freedom and security. And however our eyes may be dazzled with snow, or our ears deceived by the sound, however prejudice may warp our wills, or interest darken our understanding, the simple voice of nature and of reason will say, It is right. I draw any idea of the form of government from a principle in nature, which no art can overturn. That the more simple anything is, the less liable it is to be disordered, and the easier repaired when disordered. And with this maxim in view, I offer a few remarks on the much boasted Constitution of England. That it was noble for the dark and slavish times in which it was erected is granted. When the world was overrun with tyranny, the least therefrom was a glorious rescue, but that it is imperfect, subject to convulsions, and incapable of producing what it seems to promise is easily demonstrated. Absolute governments, though the disgrace of human nature, have this advantage with them, that they are simple. If the people suffer, they know the head from which their suffering springs, know likewise the remedy and are not bewildered by a variety of causes and cures. But the Constitution of England is so exceedingly complex that the nation may suffer for years together without being able to discover in which part the fault lies. Some will say in one and some in another, and every political physician will advise a different medicine. I know it is difficult to get over local or long-standing prejudices, yet if we will suffer ourselves to examine the component parts of the English Constitution, we shall find them to be the base remains of two ancient tyrannies, 
compounded with some new Republican materials. First, the remains of monarchical tyranny in the person of the king. Secondly, the remains of aristocratical tyranny in the persons of the peers. Thirdly, the new Republican materials in the persons of the commons, on whose virtue depends the freedom of England. The first two, by being hereditary, are independent of the people. Wherefore, in a constitutional sense, they contribute nothing towards the freedom of the state. To say that the Constitution of England is a union of three powers reciprocally checking each other is farcical. Either the words have no meaning or they are flat contradictions. To say that the commons is a check upon the king presupposes two things. First, that the king is not to be trusted without being looked after, or in other words, that a thirst for absolute power is the natural disease of monarchy. Secondly, that the commons, by being appointed for that purpose, are either wiser or more worthy of confidence than the crown. But as the same constitution which gives the commons a power to check the king by withholding the supplies, gives afterwards the king a power to check the commons by empowering him to reject their other bills, it again supposes that the king is wiser than those whom it is already supposed to be wiser than him, a mere absurdity. There is something exceedingly ridiculous in the composition of monarchy. It first excludes a man from the means of information, yet empowers him to act in cases where the highest judgment is required. The state of a king shuts him from the world, yet the business of a king requires him to know it thoroughly. Wherefore, the different parts, unnaturally opposing and destroying each other, prove the whole character to be absurd and useless. Some writers have explained the English Constitution thus. The king, say they, is one, the people, another. The peers are a house in behalf of the king, the commons in behalf of the people. <clears throat> but this hath all the distinctions of a house divided against itself, and through the expressions be pleasantly arranged, yet when examined, <clears throat> they appear idle and ambiguous. It will always happen that the nicest construction that words are capable of when applied to the description of something which either cannot exist or is too incomprehensible to be within the compass of description will be words of sound only and though they may amuse the ear they cannot inform the mind for this explanation includes a previous question this, how came the king by a power which the people are afraid to trust and always obliged to check? Such a power could not be the gift of a wise people, neither can any power which needs checking be from God, yet the provision which the Constitution makes supposes such a power to exist. But the provision is unequal to the task, the means either cannot or will not accomplish the end. And the whole affair is fellow deceit, for as the greater weight will always carry up the less, and as all the wheels of a machine are put into motion by one, it only remains to know which power in the Constitution has the most weight, for that will govern, and through the others, or a part of them, may clog, or, as the phrase is, check the rapidity of its motion. Yet, so long as they cannot stop it, their endeavors will be ineffectual. The first moving power will at last have its way, and what it wants in speed is supplied by time. That the crown is this overbearing part in the English Constitution needs not be mentioned, and that it derives its whole consequence merely from being the giver of places and pensions is self-evident. Wherefore, though we have and wise enough to shut and lock a door against absolute monarchy, we at the same time have been foolish enough to put the crown in possession of the key. And now we'll go to video number three.